Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, we're just going to give it a few more minutes. We still have some attendees who are arriving, so we'll just um, give it a few more minutes to see if some more people uh, join us. In the meantime, um, you know, please enjoy the uh, slideshow um, and the historic photographs that'll put you into some of the context for today's program. Thanks. All right, it looks like there's still a few people joining, but we'll go ahead and get started now just to make sure that we uh, stay on track as best as possible. And hopefully uh, we'll continue to be joined by others as we uh, get going, but <clears throat> uh, good morning. My name is Jasper Collier and welcome to the DC Oral History Collaborative's monthly coffee chat series. This month, we're happy to present an oral history project conducted by Prologue DC in support of their outstanding digital history project, Mapping Segregation. I'd like to start by giving you a little information about the Coffee Chat series, the DC World History Collaborative and Humanities DC. Humanities DC is the State Humanities Council for Washington DC, one of 56 such private nonprofit organizations affiliated with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our mission is to enrich the quality of life, foster intellectual stimulation, and promote cross-cultural understanding and appreciation of local history in all neighborhoods of the district through humanities programs and grants. The DC Oral History Collaborative is a partnership between Humanities DC and the DC Public Library. Uh, this citywide oral history project provides funding and training to DC-based individuals and organizations to start oral history projects with their communities. The interviews are added to a growing collection of oral history resources in the DC Public Library's People's Archive. Each month, we feature past DC Oral History Collaborative project directors for our virtual coffee chat series. The series aims to illuminate the stories contributed by project narrators and encourage prospective project directors across the city to start projects of their own. I'd like to um, say special thanks to the DC Oral History Collaborative team 
at HDC and at the DC Public Library, our dedicated advisory committee and the Humanities DC staff, especially programs coordinator Tracy Mullery, who produces each of these coffee chat events. I'd also like to say thank you to, to today's ASL interpreters, Rhonda and Audrey. Thank you so much for being here with us and helping us make this program more accessible. So today we'll start with a presentation from our panelists. We'll follow that with a moderated conversation and we'll end with an audience question and answer period. Um, and so with that, I'd like to you know, introduce our panels. Hopefully, um, hopefully everybody can hear us okay. If not, uh, please let us know through the chat and we'll do what we can to uh, troubleshoot that. Um, but uh, I'll start with Mara Cherkoski, one of the project's co-directors. Mara is a historian, researcher, and writer editor focusing on everything DC, especially the city's racial history. A former journalist, she has researched and written or co-written 13 neighborhood heritage trails, as well as the DC 20th century African-American civil rights tour. She's also authored books and articles, contributed research to uh, exhibitions and documentary films, and developed historic site signage. Kara Olivia Heron, one of the project's narrators, interviewees, uh, she was interviewed about her experience growing up during the desegregation of the city's schools. Kara Olivia is a retired professor, children's book author, novelist, and librettist. Her work traces classical epic traditions throughout contemporary African-American literature and locates convergences and points of contact between blackness and Jewishness. Carol Olivia was born in 1947 and grew up at Mayfair Mansions in DC's Kenilworth neighborhood before moving with her parents to Tacoma in the early 1950s. Among the schools she attended were Paul Junior High and Coolidge High School in Ward 4. Sarah Schoenfeld, another of the project's co-directors, is a public historian and independent scholar specializing in DC history. She is interested in the city's historically racialized housing landscape and planning regime and the intersection of race and historic preservation. Working for Blackside, the film company best known for Eyes on the Prize, America in the Civil Rights Years, and for WGBH TV on other Black-led film projects, influenced the trajectory of Sarah's work following the completion of an MA in history at Northeastern University. Uh, thank you all again for joining us. And now, Sarah, I'll turn things over to you to start the presentation. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us today. Uh, it's really nice to see so many people here. Uh, so I'm just going to begin by giving you a bit of background uh, on our project, uh, Mapping Segregation in Washington, DC, uh, which serves as the context for this oral history project that, that we undertook. So the primary goal of, of, our, of mapping segregation, uh, which was launched uh, back in 2014, uh, uh, was and remains uh, uh, the mapping of the extent, the historic extent of racially restrictive deed covenants, uh, which created all white neighborhoods in the district by legally barring black renters or home buyers from large sections of the city uh, until almost 1950. We've also mapped the, the city's changing racial demographics to show the impact of covenants and what happened once they stopped being used. And we began the project by looking at the impact of covenants in DC's Bloomingdale neighborhood, which was an epicenter of legal challenges to covenants. Uh, but pretty early on, we also began to look at Ward 4. And so we've got uh, one of our story maps. I'm gonna click here uh, specifically uh, is about uh, what happened in Ward 4, in, in DC's Ward 4. So this is the city's uh, northernmost ward. Um, so shown here. It's bounded on the south by Spring and Rock Creek Church roads, and it extends all the way to the district line. Most of Ward 4 is east of Rock Creek Park, and it includes Petworth, Crestwood, Brightwood, Tacoma, and Shepherd Park, uh, among other neighborhoods. Uh, this map shows the distribution of white and black residents in 1934. Uh, and as you can see, this part of the city was almost entirely white occupied, except for a few small black communities. And the largest of these was at Fort Stevens in Brightwood here and dated to the 1920s, or I'm sorry, to the 1820s. Uh, so, very historic black community around this uh, Civil War fort at Fort Stevens. 
So while these Black communities might have expanded during the 20th century, based on the scale of Black migration to DC, and the relative affordability of homes in this section as compared to say west of Rock Creek Park, the use of restrictive covenants and other tactics such as the closure of schools that served black children prevented the expansion of black settlement here and reserved almost all of this section of the city for white residents. So this is, uh, I've just clicked to show you what, uh, how much of, uh, this, this shows all of the restrictive deed covenants that we've identified in this section of the city thus far. So that's the, um, this is the historical context for our oral history project, um, which involved interviewing both black Washingtonians who began desegregating Ward 4 in the late 1950s and white former residents whose families moved away from these neighborhoods during the same period. Most of the interview clips we're gonna show that we're gonna to share today are of black residents who still lived in DC as of 2017 when we did this project, uh, including this first one with a man named Joe Hairston, uh, who's since passed away at age 97. Some of you may know Joe, uh, some of you who are joining us today, uh, especially from Shepherd Park, um, he, he was an early leader of the group Neighbors Inc. Uh, in Shepherd Park, which we'll discuss later. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna play a clip where he describes his family's initial move into DC in 1954 to the 1300, the 1300 block of Kennedy Street in Petworth. Mr. Harrison was in the military and the family had been living at Fort, Re Fort Meade in Maryland before moving to DC. The image you'll see on the screen uh, with, with the clip uh, is of our Ward 4 story map, which I was just clicking through um, because we've actually included that audio clip in the story map. I was concerned about the racism uh, because from Cardoza all the way north was all white. I tried to buy a house on 13th Street and several places and the, they wouldn't sell to me. And so it was a shock when these people accepted. But when I first moved in, I was concerned. See, my family was safe at Fort, Fort Myer, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the first day after I got possession of the house, I moved in just myself and slept on the floor with, with a loaded 45. I, I'm a military person. So weapons or just in case somebody wanted to do something and after a couple of days nobody did anything so then I moved by brought my oldest daughter to see 54 she would have been uh, 14 14 or 15 years old so I want them to see two people a male and a female and so we both slept on the floor and nothing happened. We did that a couple of days, then we brought the whole family. And there was no, no, no action against us. It was just, you could see and feel the racism. So that's Joe. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I misspoke uh, and said that his family moved from Fort Meade. He, he clearly said he, they, they lived at Fort Myer in Virginia. So that was my mistake. And I'm going to turn it over now to Mara uh, to, play, to play another clip. Hi, everyone. Um, and actually, uh, Black families started moving into Ward 4 in the early 1950s, not the late 1950s. In, in this next clip, Bobby Coles, the narrator, tells about the time her family had just moved on to the 1200 block of Van Buren Street Northwest, just off Georgia Avenue in Brightwood. It was 1957, and they were the first Black family on the block. Mrs. Coles was 12 at the time, and her sister was nine. So she's telling here, or she will in the clip, tell how all the white neighbors, or a group of white neighbors organized to buy their house back so that the neighbors could resell it to a white family. And this group showed up announced one, unannounced one day. So, and in, uh, when the clip start comes, you'll see a picture of the house as it looks today. It culminated in a big, it 
culminated in a big meeting at the house. We didn't invite these people, it was all men, and led by a police officer in his uniform and weapon. <laughs> you mean they, they converged on your house? On our house. And they brought a policeman or you or your dad? He was so-called the spokesman. Really? Yeah, for the group of men in the neighborhood. And so they came to the house with the idea of offering to buy them out. And they offered, the house was only 18000 well that, that was a big deal in those days, $18,000. Uh, they pay asking price and they pay that um, but they offered five thousand above that and um, oh and to pay the interest that we, we had been paying so uh, daddy saw him coming they didn't uh, announce that they were coming and ask for an appointment to come over he just saw this these group of people coming up the street and so uh, he sent us up, my, me and my sister upstairs. We didn't go all the way. He went, go in your room. Go in your room. <laughs> and mother was sitting in the dining room, actually with the pistol, because we didn't know what, being, especially being from the South, we didn't know what to expect. So, at um, any rate, they came in. They, the guy pitched the, the plan that it didn't allow for anybody to sit down. And uh, in those days, you would have offered somebody a seat. So if you weren't offered a seat, you just need to find one. And so, at any rate, uh, they, uh, the guy, the police officer, pitched the plan and everything. Everybody was very polite quiet and so uh, daddy asked him had he finished and so he said well you get the gist that's basically it and so daddy said well uh, thank you for the offer it seems like you really thought about what you are saying and he said but the answer is no and that's when the others chimed in and they couldn't believe it. You know what you're giving up after all we're offering, all this money and stuff like that? And he said, we bought this house, and this is our house, and we intend to stay. And so, um, then he ushered them out. He said, now it's time to leave my house. It's the first time he said, my house. <laughs> Uh, growing up in Alabama, we seen some violence, so we, my sister and I, was, we were hugging each other and softly crying. And when we got downstairs, Daddy was crying, and Mother were crying too. So, because there was fear, it was nothing anger or or anything. It was just plain old fear, and that's when it, they really stepped up the harassment. I have to apologize for the noise. We recorded that interview in the dining room of her building. That's where she wanted to go and um, it was really noisy, but uh, luckily we have the transcription there. And the harassment she referred to was neighborhood kids dumping out the family's trash, constantly cutting through their yard, calling the girls names and threatening them, vandalizing their car, teasing their dogs, stealing the newspaper, all, all that type of thing. So uh, in this next clip, the narrators are sisters, Audrey Hinton and Diane Hinton Perry, and they discuss why their father wouldn't let them play in the front yard. Their family moved to the 1300 block of Farragut Street Northwest, across from West Elementary School in 1953. They too were the first black family on the block, and their story was similar to the one told by Joe Harrison, involving a gun and all of that. And, um, Anyway, I'll get ready for the clip. We had a big backyard. And as I think he probably already heard, we couldn't play out front. You know, Daddy said it that didn't look nice to play out front. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, it doesn't look nice. So we had to play out back, but we had a big backyard. So there was really not much reason not to play back there. 
So, so did kid, other kids come there, or, did, or was it just you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Friends. Don, have you ever really thought about why we couldn't play off? What would have been your thoughts on that? <laughs> your theories? I have some. <laughs> no, I have a lot. Of, I've actually written about this. Um, no, it's just an um, uh, image thing. You know, black people are perceived as being hanging out on the front, and my father didn't want us to project that image. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think there's, that was a, there's a class thing too, so. you know, class distinctions and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Originally, our project was going to be about school desegregation, but in the interviews we conducted, people spoke often about neighborhood change, too. And that's reflected in the uh, clips we've played so far. The Hinton sisters spoke about having to be in their interview, um, which part we didn't play, having to be driven two miles to school every day when West Elementary School was right across the street. Sarah's next clip is about a different school experience. Right. So something else that Joe Harrison spoke to me about was his daughter's experience uh, as part of the first wave of Black students to attend Petworth's Roosevelt High School. Uh, so in this clip, he the, uh, this clip, I just want to mention the Charlene that he refers to uh, may be familiar to some of you as Charlene Drew Jarvis, uh, who represented Ward 4 on the D.C. Council for 20 years uh, back in the 1980s and 90s. And actually, the, the photo that's shown with the clip, because I don't have a photo of Joe's daughter, I've included a photo of the Drew family with this interview clip. But Roosevelt, the uh, principal of the school, was a Southern racist. She was an excellent principal, as you know, as a educator goes. But uh, when our when my daughter graduated with uh, Charlene's oldest sister. Uh, she wouldn't permit a prom because she didn't want white girls dancing with black boys. And so Charlene's mother and I and a few other parents, we got together and arranged for a prom for our, our daughters at the Willard Hotel downtown just across from J.W. Mary. And, uh, and uh, Joe wasn't the only one who mentioned to me the separate proms at Roosevelt. Uh, in this next clip, a longtime Petworth resident named Genevieve or Jenny Anderson uh, is speaking to two students from E.L. Haynes Public Charter School, whom we trained to do oral history interviews. Uh, the students who were seniors in high school conducted these interviews with elders who were regulars at the Senior Wellness Center uh, that occupies a former movie theater on Kennedy Street. Uh, in Petworth. Uh, and Miss Anderson is shown here uh, uh, with the students who interviewed her. The school gave a prom, somebody gave a prom, but the regular prom that was given, the white parents got together and gave their kids a big prom somewhere. And then the black families in the school gave the black kids a prom. I don't remember having any white friends when I was in high school. There were probably white kids in my class, but we weren't really together. friends. We yeah. just were just in school together. I was happy to get out of there. I didn't necessarily like it, but it was okay. And then I have one more uh, audio clip that I want to share from the students' oral history interviews. This one features Eleanor Craig, who was among the children who desegregated Petworth's Barnard Elementary School. And she's shown uh, in the image uh, here with the clip uh, with her brothers, uh, who also shared their memories. Uh, and she's shown with them and the two students who interviewed that family. And Tracy, do you want to play that that clip of Eleanor Craig? I should say when it was segregated, it seemed like the teachers took more of an interest in their kids learning, even if it meant, you know, keeping them in the school with a little extra time after school was over so that they would understand 
uh, what was being taught that day because the teachers were black, the, the kids were black. They gave you a little more extra time. When it became integrated, you didn't get the same kind of one-on-one, -on -one, so to speak, with the teachers. I didn't seem as though they took as much time uh, with the students as they did when it was segregated. Thank you. And um, so that, sorry about that, my mistake. I had thought that we had a picture of her, but uh, that uh, the, the image you saw is from our story map, because again, this is one of the audio clips that you can actually click on uh, uh, to hear uh, in our Ward 4 story map. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Mara again. Okay, so this next clip is uh, about Felicia Fonsoroy Bowman's experience being one of the first Black students in her class at West Elementary. She was actually a friend of and in the same class with Audrey Hinton. Her family moved to the 1200 block of Ingraham Street in January 1954, just a few months before the US Supreme Court called for schools to be desegregated. The school she'd started out, started out at was Parkview Elementary close to Howard University. In the photo you're about to see, she's second from the left in, in case it's not marked. How did the neighborhood change? You said you're the first one of two, you were the second family on the on the block. How quickly did it change? Where I mean, very quickly. Um, going back to West, uh, I and two friends integrated West in October 1954. And I think it was the day after my birthday, my seventh birthday. And sometime during that year, two more black students came. So by the end of the year, there were five of us in the class. By a second grade, by fourth grade, we had a black teacher. It was first, she was the black, first black teacher at the school. And fifth grade, we had a black teacher. By sixth grade, most of the white kids had left. There were a few, two were Greek. They were still there, uh, most of, and most of the white kids were Jewish when we in in fifty four, and they had all left for Silver Spring or whatever. We right, mean. right. And what was it like that first day or those first weeks or at at West? At West? There were three of us: uh, Audrey, Michael and I, and there were three groups, and I was in group one. Are those so like reading groups? Reading groups, level, so the, 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 the um, desks were oh. in rows, and uh, sitting next to me was my friend Dorothy, who was Chinese, and sitting across from her was uh, Paula, who was Jewish, and um, Paula, Audrey, uh, Dorothy and I became close friends and still are, as you know. I, I think I already was fairly competitive and um, I remember uh, Mrs. Ryan was our teacher, was asking about something and I, I didn't know what she was talking about. I guess Audrey and Michael didn't either. And so she brought us up to the uh, center of the class to go over it with us. And I was embarrassed by that. I didn't understand race, but I I was embarrassed. I mean, you felt that you were picked, picked, picked yeah, out? Yeah, you know, it, something. it was something we didn't know that other kids may have known. And to this day, I can't tell you what it was. Um, going back to I guess the summer before the Supreme Court case was in May, mm -hmm. and so then this was going to happen in this October. You know, integration was going to happen in September. Was there any kind of, you know, preparation? No, but I will say I recall my father having some concerns about whether I should leave Parkview and go to West. Did you have a choice? Yes. And Parkview, by the way, was a lab school of Howard. So it wasn't um, really an inferior school. 
and it had some um, resources that West didn't have. So my father didn't feel that I had to go to West to get a better education. And he also didn't, because they didn't know the teachers, they didn't want teachers who would make me feel less than. But um, I do also think that Audrey's parents, my parents and Michael's parents might have gotten together and talked um, to make sure we were properly treated. But I don't remember any incident, any negative incidents. Uh, I think Mrs. Ryan, the teacher, was very famous. I should mention that one of the um, one of our methods for finding narrators is to ask is to tell everyone about our projects when we're doing them, and invariably someone we already know will say, "Oh, you should also interview these other people, my friends from grade school or whatever," and and that's how we found. I already knew Felicia from um, an earlier from earlier projects, but her friends. I interviewed all of those friends she mentioned, except the, uh, Michael. And Michael was Michael Syfax. Syfax is a really big name in DC. So here's another short clip, a shorter clip from Felicia Bowman in which she praises the DC public schools. And that's not a story often told about the 1960s. She graduated from high school in 1965. Private schools. You were all happy with the Public, yes, public very schools. much so, very much so. And the older you get and the farther I get away from it, uh, I appreciate the education all the more. I was prepared for college. I was prepared for the workplace. So I don't feel um, the system did not serve me well. Now I was in honors, I was you know, in the academic um, track and it may well have been the children who were not, who were, didn't fare as well. Although my cousin, I had a first cousin who, who uh, was three weeks younger than I am. She's now deceased. And she chose not to go to college, but she left Roosevelt knowing how to um, do shorthand and type, and she got a job in the federal government immediately um, and so she was prepared for what she wanted to do. And I have many friends um, that didn't go to college, but still did, did fine. So I have one more clip here, I think. And then it's a little bit different because it's about the desegregation of a private school, Sidwell Friends, which didn't happen until 1964. The narrator is David Nicholson, whose family lived in Bloomingdale, the neighborhood Sarah spoke about earlier. His grandparents had bought their house in the 1920s. He arrived at Sidwell Friends in 1965, so he was part of the second small group of black students the, the school accepted. The school really wanted these students to succeed, so it was careful about which ones it let in, and then it provided them scholarships. You'll see his senior class photo. You know, in, in, in retrospect, there were many aspects of it that were really uncomfortable. All the boys wore regions, <laughs> these loafers, right. uh, AKA penny loafers, <laughs> you know, and I was like uh, probably a senior before I got a pair of, a pair of fake regions, <laughs> you know, but, but that was nothing different for me because in um, at Jefferson, all the boys wore Chuck Taylor tennis shoes, and I don't remember what you know street shoes they wore, but they wore a kind of pants that they call gabardines, and then they wore like uh, London fog windbreakers. When we went to the store, we bought we bought our winter clothes right when summer was starting because they were on sale. And we bought our summer goals when winter was starting because you know they were marked down like 50%. Um, so I never wore clothes that were fashionable. And if my mother didn't have the money to send me to Bobby Davis's barbershop, 
on First Street, I just my hair just grew until we had the money. So I got teased, you know, about it. And this is way before it was fashionable to have a big afro. Um, so I got teased about that in, 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 in junior high school. And I'm not sure, I want to say it didn't matter, friends, because people didn't care. I don't know if Lonnie Edmondson talks about this in the book. Lonnie was a year ahead of me, and, and, and he may have talked about how when he came to Friends, he really dressed up. You know, he may have said something like, I got dressed up because that's what you did. That's what black, black people really dress up. And then he got there and realized he was like completely overdressed. I mean, did you end up with these stilted discussions in class because people, I don't know what, in history or whatever class? No, I don't something. really recall recall that. I mean, I mean, I, I don't recall discussions, say, about slavery in the Civil War. Okay, but I do remember reading a poem and it, it had, you know, the words, the man in it. And so the teacher said, okay, and perhaps David can tell us what this means. And I said, well, I think it's the policeman. And she said, no, it's the white man. <laughs> and I, you know, I'd never heard anybody say that. I mean, again, I mean, I think mine was a middle-class family. Uh, that was interesting hearing that again and how dressed up uh, people got because that I don't think that was just the case at Sidwell. I mean, looking at, if you recall the photo that we saw, saw during the slideshow, uh, there were some students, uh, both a white student and a black student in that cafeteria line that were wearing uh, jackets and ties uh, at McFarland Junior High School. Uh, uh, so I'm going to um, I'm going to sort of transition here um, into another well, obviously very related topic. But as I mentioned at the beginning, our narrators um, also included white Washingtonians uh, who no longer live in D.C., whose families moved out of Ward 4 uh, in the in the late 50s or early 60s. Um, and in fact, we twice had the opportunity to interview members of both African-American and white families who resided on the same blocks during this period of their neighborhood's racial transformation. Uh, so in this next short clip, uh, you'll, you'll hear two sisters named Martha and Barbara Sargovitz, whose family moved in 1948 to 406 Oneida Street Northeast in DC's Lamond Riggs neighborhood, uh, also known as Riggs Park. Uh, the block was barely developed when they first moved there, but it quickly evolved into a Jewish enclave. Uh, there was a synagogue, uh, Shartafila, where, that they could walk to uh, that was right down the street on Riggs Road. And they described to me what, what sounded like a pretty idyllic childhood. Uh, but around 1960, uh, when the block, you know, the houses on this block were barely more than 10 years old, the Sargovitz's neighbors began moving away, uh, mostly to Silver Spring, Maryland. Uh, so here they are talking, uh, describing their memory of a real estate practice called blockbusting. Uh, this, this common practice relied on racist stereotypes to get white people to move out so that their homes could then be sold at inflated prices to black families. And I remember a guy coming through the neighborhood and scaring people, telling them blacks are going to move in and the, your house, the value of your house is going to go down and like I can't even estimate the time frame. Everyone white was gone. And oh, what's the name? I remember the guy. You know, I can't remember his face or anything, but I remember oh, they really did terrorized. use scare tactics. Yeah. But my parents weren't going to move, and they just said my that. father just looked and said, hey, "We're not crazy. moving. We're not you moving." Know? Uh, uh, another one of our um, white narrators whose family moved to who lived whose family lived in Petworth and also and moved to Silver Spring in the 1950s also recalled specific uh, predatory real estate practices aimed at pushing white homeowners to leave the neighborhood. Uh, and, and something else that the Sargovitz has talked about in recounting their experiences with the the local public schools uh, was having to celebrate Christian holidays at the school. Um, like Easter and, and Christmas, um, even though they and all their peers were observant Jews. 
they said their parents just went along with it, that they didn't want to rock the boat. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning this because uh, this is something uh, that the narrator who is with us today uh, from our project, Cara Olivia Haran, uh, also talked about in her interview uh, with me. Uh, Cara Olivia's family moved in 1961 from the entirely black development of Mayfair mansions in DC's Ward 7, east of the Anacostia River, to Tacoma in Ward 4. Uh, so I want to um, have Cara Olivia come on now and, and maybe um, she can tell us a little bit about uh, her memories of, of Paul Junior High, uh, you know, entering Paul Junior High in Brightwood and then attending Coolidge High School in Tacoma. Yes, indeed. I, I still, it's a very important day in, in my own life. I remember the African-American students, we were Negroes then, and then we were going from Negro to Black to African-American. <laughs> Uh, I remember we were celebrating Christmas and the only Christians in the class at Paul were the black kids and the white teacher. And the white teachers hated the black kids and they didn't seem to like the Jewish kids either. The white Christian teachers didn't like the white Jewish kids and didn't like the black Christian kids. And, but it's almost like there was a three-way conflict going in the classroom, which I could not, I really didn't understand it, but I, I felt it. And I, as we were all singing these Christmas carols, the black kids up front singing Christmas carols and the Jewish kids um, were quiet in the room, but they all turned their chairs around and with their backs to us. And at that point, I, I had no sense of differentiating a white person, whether it was a Christian white person or a Jewish white person, they were just white people to me. And I was really hurt. And I remember turning, leaning over to my cousin, Shannon, I said, why do they hate us so much? What have we done to them? We didn't hurt them. You know, why do they hate us so much? And, and I can remember the, 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 the kids with their backs to us were not, didn't look particularly mad or mean, but the teacher did look mad and mean, but she didn't tell, she didn't say anything to the students, either of us. And later on, on the playground, we were all standing on one side and the Jewish kids were on the other side. And a young, Jewish boy came across the path. And that, it's a very, to me, what, what, what moral strength he must have had. He came across the barrier and talked to me and explained to me, he says, we're not mad at you, but we're upset because we're Jewish and we don't celebrate Christmas, but we have to come to school or we, we get marked down and punished for not coming to the, to the celebration. And my, my mind just opened up for the first time. I began to see this difference in, in, in difference and differences. Uh, and and um, I, I you know, talked to him a little while longer and I spoke to the other students. And even though it didn't blossom right then, to me, that was the beginning of the black Jewish liaison coming toward 1963 and the March on Washington. That's what, for me, that's what it began. It didn't begin that day, but Oh, I guess it did begin that day, but but it didn't uh, blossom that day, I should say. But it did eventually, especially when we got to, and at Coolidge, I can remember um, the white kids would had the privilege of, of a special room in the basement where they could go and play music and stuff. And nobody ever told black kids we couldn't go there, but we knew we didn't go, belong there. So we didn't go in there. But what would happen is every the white kids would start calling us into that room. And, and, and I'd go in and I remember sitting there and they said, listen to this. And we are, and like four or five black kids and four or five white kids who were Jewish kids, as I understood later, but I didn't, I still hadn't gotten that all clear in my mind, heard Peter, Paul and Mary for the first time. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man? And those kind of things. And the civil rights movement arrived in my life in that basement room where the, where the Jewish white kids invited the black kids in to join us. Uh, and, and that was uh, 62 or so. And by 63, we were marching together on the mall. Uh, that doesn't mean that the teachers were very nice, but the, the, the students, um, I, I, we still, we, even at our 50th, at our 50th reunion, uh, we came together again. Um, just like the song, black and white together, holding hands together and dancing together and so forth. Um, so we, we had actually a union there 
very nasty teachers though. I remember so many things they they did to us. Um, the Latin teacher would not allow the black students coming through the front door, discouraging black people from learning the classics, which is my field among other things. We have so little time. I, I can tell, I can go on and on. So you, mm -hmm. you, Well, can you tell us um, about the, your experience with the counselor? Yes, uh, Ms. Mrs. Sweeney, I use her name on, as, because I want people to know the name of this woman who took it upon herself to make sure that any black student at Coolidge High School who had had gifts would not get to college. There were, uh, we all took the SATs and the PSATs and so forth to get into college and 10 black students got in the 99th percentile nationwide, the top school students in the country on the SATs. And I was one of those 10 students. She called each one of us into her office individually and told us that we were not qualified for college. She get, came up, I found out later, she came up with a different story for each one of us. For me, it was, you shouldn't go, you should let your brother go. My brother's seven years younger than I am, that sort of thing. And, and uh, I was told on, by, later by one of the other black students, he was told that, that uh, although he had some gifts with music, that he had a tin ear or something. And, and, he, and, he, and he gave up going to college and trying to go into music because of that. So she, she and we, I applied for seven or eight universities to go to college. I didn't even get rejected. She never sent them out. They were never even mailed out. Uh, when I tried to take the, the college board exam, uh, they didn't even, I paid, my, my parents paid for me to take it. I was the only black kid that was taking the writing part of it because I thought I could write, you know? And they didn't even tell me when they were giving it. When I went downstairs to, to take it in the cafeteria, they were like 20 minutes already into it. Into it. it was another student, another black student told me, they're, they're doing the exam for the writers downstairs. You should go down, you can write. And I went down and, and I had like, like a little corner. I had to squeeze in. I could hardly get my paper down to, to, in order to write. It was awful. Uh, it, was, it was awful. And I, uh, and I guess I was rejected. I, I mean, I, 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 um, I shouldn't say I was rejected because I didn't, um, I didn't do well on the writing. I didn't have a chance to write and I didn't get into any college and I was totally depressed and, 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 a, and a basket case. Um, and, and we didn't know what to do. I wish I, you know, when you're a teenager, you don't know. I told my parents, all we had to do was take me down to Howard University. We'd take the test at Howard or some other place like that. It would have been fine. And we didn't know, I didn't know to do that. And, and um, my father said, don't worry. I'd already skipped the grade earlier. So, so I was actually on time anyway. And he sent me to learn French for a year. Uh, and my mother just went down to Howard University one day and filled out an application pretending she was me. I was sitting on this front porch and got the acceptance to Howard University. I had never applied. And that's where I'm teaching, by the way. I teach there <laughs> next week. Uh, but I want to say one more thing. Um, I have to talk about Neighbors Incorporated and Marvin Kaplan. I Please, have, yes. I have to mention them because I was sitting here. It's funny. It's the same room I was sitting in, wondering why white people hate us so much. What did we do? And did they hurt? You no, know, they they stole my family and slaves all the years. And what what did we do to make them so mad? I can remember picking up a beautiful bunch of grapes at the Safeway. That's right. It was it's, it's the third version of Safeway I've seen here, but it was a beautiful bunch of grapes. And I picked the best bunch to put it in my basket. And they look at you like, you don't deserve beautiful grapes. Uh, what kind of people are these? They don't even want you to have food. I was sitting on the sofa and there was a knock on the door and it was Neighbors Incorporated. It was Marvin Kaplan and three other people. There were two white people, two black people, two men, two women. And they came in and said, we've come to welcome you to the neighborhood. And I opened the door on the very, day in the very moment when I was debating, what am I gonna do living around these people who hate me so much? And they came in and they explained that Neighbors Incorporated was there to counteract this blockbusting idea and to assure people that, that their African-American neighbors are just a good and that the white people accept the black people and that we all, we, we're together. And I, I, he, he, changed, he changed my life. My parents were upstairs and my brother they all came downstairs. We did offer everybody a seat. I, I, I know, I understood that part. 
and we sat and talked for, for an hour and it, and it changed my life. I am the current president of Neighbors Incorporated. And I saw Martin Kaplan again, about three or four months before he died, I sat next to him at the, um, at the Fairth Israel congregation, which is where I'm a member. I'm, a, I'm Jewish, I'm a member of the Fairth Israel, where Marvin Kaplan uh, was a member. And we got to relive that day together a few, a, a few weeks before he died. That was, that was a, a joy. Um, so. Uh, uh, something else that I, in rereading some of your interview yesterday, Carol Olivia, uh, that uh, you speculated about, and I can't remember if that, maybe you could say first where, uh, when exactly did you all move to Tacoma and yes, what block did you live, what block did you move to? Yes, there was a little bit of a, a confusion there, a, little, a couple of mistakes. Uh, okay. Like in, um, my... I did not move to, I moved in 61, which is what somebody corrected, I heard today, not the early 1950s, mm -hmm. but um, we, we had, I, I had um, been staying with my aunt in, this, in the neighborhood who, who had moved much earlier to Van Buren Street, second in Van Buren, and actually used that address as my home address to go to Paul. I was not a resident of the neighborhood when I went to Paul. Um, but, but um, so, so I, I, and I, I, I recognize so many of the things other interviewees have said. The dressing up—I thought, what was wrong with white people? You, they, they would they would dress down to go to the to the zoo instead of dressing up. We put on our best clothes to go places, and they looked like tramps and bums. I, I I was freaked out. What is wrong with these people? But it is it is a part of trying to look your best and be your best because the, the outside world will take any excuse to oppress you if you don't look nice. And that 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 was I think that was. Um, racially and culturally uh, and mm -hmm. inspired. You know, we, we mm -hmm. couldn't wear raggedy jeans or things like that, no way in the world. And I used to remember going to the zoo and being astonished at, at what um, white kids would wear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry, any other thing you want uh, me to clarify? Well, something that I, that, that you had speculated about in your interview about the practice of blockbusting oh. uh, uh, was that it seemed like it would be, it was perhaps more, um, effective if, if, if on these blocks that were you know almost entirely white or entirely white when, when a black family would move to the middle of the block versus I, I, like the near the corner i feel talked that about that very strongly indeed i still do I, even as even now as our block is changing the I, I i live in the house in the middle of the block here and it's the tallest house it's the brick house surrounded by by the frame houses it's got more people have upgraded their houses so that they're bigger than mine now but originally this was like you know the the the, the anchor and the, and the one across the street was an anchor on that side and there were three black families when i moved in one across the street and one on either side of this one and so this person the family in this house where i am had black people across the street and on both sides and and they were like they were like the manor house so and it became a, it became an anchor when I, my family moved here. Then two two black families moved on either side of people across the street, and seriously, for fifty years, those six houses became the that's that's the block that's the anchor. People on the edges can move in and out and be black, white, or any other kind of thing they want to be, but it doesn't change in the center. And and the center uh, did not change until I, I guess it was about four years ago. The, the, the racial of the center, and, uh, although the edges changed um, several times in the, in the process. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I for me that sort of introduces a really interesting like line of inquiry into sort of the micro history of blockbusting and like how that actually like the mm -hmm. tactics of real estate brokers and did they you know focus on getting black families into the middle of blocks. Um, and then something that, we, that that, that could I, be explored further, sir, I think. And that and th these doing interviews with people like you is very revealing for mm -hmm. you know that these these kinds of things you can't necessarily know unless you talk to people. So um, well, I've, I met the family, Mrs. Pops, the family that lived here. Um, she, she, the the mother, she was a teacher at Coolidge, so she taught me. I, and I, and I remember once I was here in the house and I found a beautiful amazing ring, some garnet, some beautiful ring that they had left. And I took it to school and gave it to her. And she'd been wait, wondering where her ring had been all for, for, since she had moved out. 
Wow. And it was like, I gave it back to her. I said, we found this ring in the closet. You know, is it your ring? I know. It, and it, and it, was, it was wonderful. It was, it was delightful. It was, it was nice. I, I had, she seemed like a good teacher. I don't know what was going on. I think she must have felt terrible. I don't know what kind of pressures, she would have to tell you the pressures mm-hmm. they had. But, but it felt like, like, she, like she was being attacked. Well, that, that this household, this white household, whether it was white, what, by what outsiders would, would be what would have called attacked. But of course, it's not an attack. Just human beings trying to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. But I, 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 I do. I am interested in the way neighborhoods blocks change because I, the Seventh Place, Seventh Street. I, I compare the same theory. I've been, I've been watching how it works there as well. Uh, who the center and and the and the periphery. And what what seems to make the the block um, move forward? For the first time in in, in about twelve years, we're having a block party in September, and I think it's related to the power that the center has, and it brings in the the size. But that, that's 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 for you, historian, yeah. to figure out. Mm. Right, right. Well, I guess you're likely to know more people if you live in the center, right? I mean. Yeah, Just, yeah, I mean, in terms of who you see yeah, on a you regular go, basis. First, you just start waving, and then you wave yeah. and say something, and then, and then eventually, yeah, it becomes, mm-hmm. uh, it becomes different somehow. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure other people have questions for for us and for Carol Olivia, so I I, uh, I won't take up all, all the time with my questions here. But uh, uh, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really great to have you here with us today. Mm-hmm. So, thank. Hey, thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Thank, Thanks to all of you. It was an um, excellent presentation, and it's amazing to hear this story told uh, with the voices of the people who lived it. And thank you so much, Carol Olivia, for showing, sharing your memories with us. You know, at today's event, um, we um, look. It looks like we already have some questions that people are starting to ask in the chat. So I think we can forego most of the moderated conversation part of this uh, panel. I think that we've already, you know, kind of gotten to that through the. Uh, you know, discussion that um, Sarah and Carol Olivia were just having. Um, so I want to make sure we leave time for the questions. Um, but one of the you know goals of the Oral History Coffee Chat is also to encourage people who are attending these programs to create oral history projects of their own with their communities on topics that they're interested in. So, you know, I just wanted to ask one question about the process of doing this oral history project. It can be you know, kind of the basic one that we, um, you know, ask at every uh, program, you know, now that you've done oral histories, and I know that you've done a lot of oral histories at this point before and after this project, but what advice would you give to people who do want to record, document, preserve these stories with people who are in their communities? Well, I, I mentioned telling everybody, I always tell everybody I know, including my dentist, you know, doctor, all of them about my projects because it's happened. The orthodontist said, oh, my wife grew up in Mount Pleasant. This is when I was writing the history of Mount Pleasant and <laughs> went over and talked to her and got photos from the 20s. I mean, it was amazing. So, and that, so that's, that was the best way I found to find narrators. Mm-hmm. And you, you can start on your own block with your neighbors your longtime neighbors and church take let people take you to church and introduce you to their um, fellow congregants that's another good way and yeah i mean as mara said there's people generally know other people that they can connect you with um i think going into into interviews it's really it can be helpful to have, you know, photographs, uh, maybe some historic photographs that might jog people's, you know, memories. Um, uh, but definitely, I think if you can, um, you know, it, 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 it's nice when you can interview people that have a relationship with other people that you've already talked to. And so you then you, you sort of build your own knowledge of their, you know, their personal history and sort of, you know, it, it, it makes it, um, more natural to sort of engage in, in a conversation with people. Um, the, the, the more you sort of, you know, build your your knowledge base of their history, that neighborhood and their relationships. Right, and really do your homework on the neighborhood because it's very helpful. Well, it's great to do your own neighborhood because at least you know where things 
are in the geography of it. It's also helpful to know where things were. And it also, not only does it help the interview along, it, it builds your, you know, credibility about, because, uh, well, that you, that you, that you are really part of the neighborhood, not just sort of like an anthropologist coming in and, you know, mining the neighborhood, that type of thing. And just some, some uh, practical advice is know your equipment, know how it works <laughs> so that you're actually recording the interview when you think you are. You don't run out of um, memory on it, um, all that type of thing. Just practice on your equipment before you go into an interview and let people talk. Don't try to finish their sentences. Don't, don't assume they're going to say a certain thing. Just space it. Empty space is okay in an interview. It's not the radio. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much. I um, mean, you know, it's really helpful to have that advice from um, you know world historians who have been practicing and have done so much great work in the city. Um, you know, like I said, I think that we you know already have some questions coming into the chat, and we'll try to get to those. But I um, just want to let people know that it's easier for us to keep track of the questions if you put them in the Q and A. So please, if you have questions for our panel during this kind of final part of the program, put those into the Q&A. Um, if you, you know, would like to ask your question on camera or you'd like your voice to be heard, uh, you can also use the raise hand feature and Tracy can elevate you to a speaker uh, so that you can ask those questions out loud as well. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and turn things over to the Q&A period. Um, so we have... Um, a question in the Q&A to get started with, um, have people organized neighborhood groups to do this? Examples, and have you worked with any villages? I know uh, that uh, Nor North Portal Estates neighborhood has, which in fact, it's Felicia Bowman. She, um, she's gotten really, in, she's become a historian since I originally worked with her. She was the executive director of the public, DC Public Service Commission. We wrote a hist uh, centennial history of the PSC, and she organized an oral history project. Well, it's a history project of her neighborhood, including oral histories. So I think quite a few neighborhoods are doing their own oral history projects. There's a great oral history archive at a historic Chevy Chase DC. And then of course, Capitol Hill has Capitol. a very long standing oral history project, but um, uh, the uh, I would say, Humanities DC and maybe Jasper can even, I mean, there is a great resource for for looking at, at these groups that have formed to do these kinds of projects through the DC Oral History Collaborative uh, and the and the the community heritage grants that they've offered for a very long time or support specifically this kind of work of, of community groups coming together and, and documenting their own history. The Dig DC um, uh, page on of the DC Public Library's website lists a number of projects with and the interviews are there we'll put and, that and more in. and they're always being uploaded we'll, we'll put that link back in the chat too so that people can access that and it looks like there are um just a couple of questions here in the chat as well that we can get to um loretta newman asks are you also interviewing people who live in these neighborhoods today about what is currently happening, such as the whites moving back into Tacoma and Shepherd Park? Demographics are changing again. Uh, we're, we are not currently, we're not doing that. There are some other people doing that. Not I, I don't know if they're specifically doing that in those neighborhoods, but I do know there was a, a book that recently came out by somebody who, who spoke with Mara and myself uh, named Shilpi Malinowski, I can put a link to it. She's, she's looking, tracking gentrification, the history of, you know, the history and sort of current racial demographic change in, um, in Shaw and LaDroit Park in Bloomingdale. Uh, and I believe there's somebody else that is working on a similar study. Um, but I don't know of anybody doing that work in the, in the neighborhoods that we've been talking about today, but. And I would be more inclined to interview the Longtime residents who are, you know, in their reactions to gentrification of the neighborhood than to interview the new people. I will, I will let someone else take that on. 
I actually think there could be some some interesting things going on with the the difference between <laughs> the old whites and the new ones. I, I don't know what to, I don't know how to put it. It's a, there, there's a significant difference that that, uh, that that's not my feel. I'm I'm into literature. I'm not a you know into interviews and things like that. But I think you could get a, a very intriguing story. And I was struck just this week. I have this horrendous two and a half foot hornet's nest on my back fence. Uh, I think I mentioned it. And two of my neighbors helped me out when I couldn't get anybody else to help me to get rid of it. And one of them was one of the a new white family that moved in and one of them had been here for a hundred years and they worked together to get this thing off of my fence. And I was thinking what a difference that is from the feeling I had sitting here in 61 and the white people were so nasty. The idea of people working together in a neighborhood. I, I, I guess it felt very much like a sea change. That, that, that one experience took me back 60 years. One, one of the people was the longtime resident was a black person, right? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. I didn't make that clear. Yes. Yeah. We talked about it in our rehearsal. Yeah, I thought I'd mentioned it. And I, I, Not today, it was in our rehearsal. Mm -hmm. There's another um, question here from Lorna asking if there are any oral histories in Foggy Bottom. Um, she did one um, at the DC Library of Nancy Drew Gregory that was, or did find one um, at the DC Library of Nancy Drew Gregory that was wonderful. Um, do, do you all know of any um, oral histories that have been done of Foggy Bottom? I know we haven't done any through the collaborative yet. I don't, I, but I'm looking at some questions about U Street and um, Kelly, uh, what's her, Na Navies, what's her last name? Kelly Navies, That's yeah. Good. She's now, she used to be at the DC Public Library. Now she's at Namak, uh, Smithsonian. She did a U Street oral history project. And, and I forgot, I did, back in the eight, mid eighties, I did my master's thesis was an oral history, was a series of oral histories of um, longtime residents of DuPont Circle and Midway. And I had, I actually had stories that went back to the 1890s. I, I interviewed a, in, 18, in 1980, Four, I interviewed a woman who was 100 years old or 101 maybe even, and she remembered, her memories are kind of like islands. I mean, they were like very specific memories with, and then like blanks. But anyway, she remembered moving to DC, taking the train to DC, I guess it was a train from uh, Mississippi or Alabama as a small child, a young child. And that was in the 1890s. Wow. And that's on tape. Those are um, at the DC Public Library. Uh, there's so many stories. You could keep on going. I, I can remember back, back when I was a kid, we all the black girls had their hair straightened. Well, I, as you may know, I had the nappiest hair in the world. My hair could not be straightened by anybody on Northeast DC. No, nothing they could do. It would die. My, it, would, it would just it would run away before it would straighten up. The only person who could straighten my hair was a, was a woman on U Street. So as a little kid, I had to go all the way across town to U Street and to the special hairdresser person who was the only person in the world who could straighten my hair until the, my mother, my mother has a joke. She says that the reason why the 60s came in was not because of civil rights and all that, because she was sick and tired of straightening, trying to straighten my hair. So when the Afro came in, she didn't have to worry about it anymore when the 60s hit. <laughs> but anyway, it's a, so, so I, I, I think you could get some wonderful stories about U Street, even from the non-U Street people, because of the, it, was a, it was a center. I remember going to Ben's Chili Bowl for the first time and way back when, and, and all the meanings it had for us coming out from Northeast and Anacostia and, and Kenilworth. Very powerful neighborhood. Uh, the, I, I would say about the question about Foggy Bottom, uh, many of the, the black residents of Foggy Bottom were uh, displaced from that neighborhood um, uh, what, between the 30s and the 50s, probably. Uh, and um, uh, it's, you know, you, if you would go into other, to other existing interviews with people uh, that live in different parts of the city, you're going to find uh, people that, talk, that do talk about that, you know, and so I, and I, I just came across it recently, a woman who moved to uh, Berry Farm when she was uh, a girl, and they had lived in Foggy Bottom, they had never had uh, 
plumbing. They, I think they lived in an you know alley housing in Foggy Bottom and and had never had any kind of basic amenities, and then moved to the brand new public housing project at Berry Farm. And and she said the first thing that that she and her sister did was go run the water in the bathtub, uh, and it was just thrilling. You know, it was beautiful, uh, brand new you know brand new place to live. So. Uh, so you can, there's so much digging to do in these oral histories that don't necessarily, um, you know, f you may not think focus on your area of interest, but, uh, and I think that um, there's a map that was recently produced uh, that identifies, uh, so it's through the DC Oral History Collaborative, and maybe there's a, maybe we can find a link to it here, uh, that identifies uh, individuals and, and neighborhoods all over the city, uh, uh, on a map so that if you're looking for a specific topic or, uh, you know, maybe a something about a specific school or I, I think that it's, you can, you know, this map will help you, you know, guide you into some of the existing oral histories that, that may mention those, the, those, those places and those events. Maybe on Brian Kraft's website. Brian Kraft yeah. made the map through, with a grant from the DC Oral History Collaborative, and I believe it was just published quite recently. Uh, yeah, I'll, so. I'll put the link to it here in the chat someone asked in the chat <clears throat> which how we pri prioritize which neighborhoods to do um i'm not sure if that means covenant research we uh if that's the question we uh started with neighborhoods where we knew we we both sarah and i both live in ward four so that's one of the reasons we've worked on Ward 4. And we had a, a previously done research involving several neighborhoods in Ward 1 and also in Bloomingdale. So that sort of, it's really slow. That, that covenant research is extremely slow. So it's not, <laughs> we're still doing the same research, same neighborhoods. Um, for oral histories, there's a matter of, we were working in Ward 4. We got a grant from DC Preservation League to research Ward 4 for mapping segregation. And so we just, that's why we focused on Ward 4. So we don't just kind of hop around. We, we a lot of our research is related to mapping segregation and we focus on the neighborhoods that we're, we focus our interviews on the neighborhoods we're researching for mapping segregation. We've also done, um, Sarah and I have both done a number of neighborhood heritage trails for cultural tourism DC and we did conducted oral histories for those so those aren't necessarily filed on uh, the dig DC but and those could be all over the city and those are sort of prioritized for us. Yeah, the, there was a for quite a while, the DC Preservation League has offered a grant to do history work in Ward 4 specifically. Um, and, and so that sort of, let, that, you know, that in looking at, we our interest was sort of in looking how, how real estate developers, um, you know, the people that actually built the neighborhood also shaped the, the racial demographics of the neighborhood and, um, and their role in that. And, and then it was fortuitous that the DC Oral History Collaborative launched several years ago uh, and when was looking, you know, at, at the time that we were starting to look at Ward 4, but then was looking for projects that do, you know, have a specific thematic focus, right? So, um, so that's, so we, we decided to hone in on this sort of period of racial transfer, you know, racial transition in these neighborhoods and, and the people that were that, there at that, at that time. Uh, Uh, There's a question, uh, Kara Olivia, in the Q and A, um, asking about your years at Brightwood Hall in Coolidge. Um, it seems like um, your 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 years might parallel closely with Joanne Harrison's. Uh, would you uh, be able to answer? Um, oh, what's the specific question? I. It's a. Uh, it says, Kara Olivia, what were your years at Brightwood Hall in Coolidge? Are histories parallel? Never, closely? Okay. Brightwood. I guess it's just the location of Paul, right? That's not. I didn't live in Brightwood. Um, I, I guess. I, I'm not under. I, I went to Paul, I guess, in 1959, 1960, perhaps. I'm, I really don't remember. I was only there for one year. 
and and I was, as I said, I was I was um, staying with, with my cousin Shannon, and, and their family lived in Van Buren Street then. And I went back back to Mayfair and went to, and graduated from Woodson Junior High School, a black school, and I went to Spingarn for a year, and then came to Coolidge in 61, 62. So I was I was never at Brightwood School, although I guess Paul is considered to be located in Brightwood. So that's my only Brightwood connection. But I did notice someone was speaking. Oh, it was I was, yes. Someone was saying she was seven years old in 1954, but so was I. <laughs> so, so I was, I was, I was trying to find who, who that person is. So we need to, we need to talk. Well, that was Felicia Bowman. Okay. Mm -hmm. She who lives in North Portal. Yeah. Okay. Now and moved on to um, Ingram Street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, so I, I can answer any other any other questions. She does. Um, she couldn't join us today because she was leaving for vacation today. Okay, Loretta. Yeah, Paul is in Manor Park, not in Brightwood. Yeah, I don't. I. I don't know. Uh, I think of, I think of Manor Park as being further uh, to the east, but I'm not sure. Well, wherever it's located, it's we know where. <laughs> whatever the neighborhood is, <laughs> it's where. It's yeah. in the same place. Yeah, you know, probably from interviewing people, it's really important to the people who live I there. I know. I know. It's like it's like I live in Tacoma. When people say I live in Brightwood, I get upset. I like Brightwood. There's nothing wrong with Brightwood. But I live in Tacoma. <laughs> the funny thing is, when I was interviewing people about Mount Pleasant, it was much. The neighborhood name was not that important then. Really? Like maybe. Not so much for Columbia Heights. I mean, for Mount Pleasant, but for Columbia Heights, they re referred to 14th, the 14th, you know, Columbia Heights, which is now, you know, all that shopping and all that Metro Center, Metro Station, um, the 14th Street corridor. It was much more fluid. I've even heard people say, the uh, people's uh, <laughs> adherence or their their observance of uh, neighborhood boundaries now is like even. It's like worse than gangs. <laughs> it's very strong. I, I thought a bit about it. Like Loretta said, yes, Manor Park is, is of course south of Tacoma, but it's south and east of, of, of Georgia Avenue is the, is the point. So Not, the Office of Planning made a map that shows neighborhoods, so now everyone is very interested in yeah, yeah, and I, neighborhoods. I, I, before I'll buy one of those t-shirts or anything that has it, I make sure they put Tacoma in the right spot or I won't <laughs> get it. I'm not ah. doing it. <laughs> I guess I can remember that first wonderful day. My brother and I went to the 4th of July and the Independence Day Parade. We ran all the way from this house here to Tacoma Park, Maryland. And that's what made us Tacoma. That's because I, I love that that particular day. It was a wonderful day. All right. Uh there's um, another question here at the top of the list from Cami asking um, if there are any tips from the researchers on researching the history of a specific address. Curious to know who purchased the house that my white relatives moved out of in the Brightwood area in the 1950s. So a house history research question. Mara, do you want to take that? Oh, I was fixing my light. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> House history. Well, uh, there the library and I think the DC History Center, formerly the Historical Society, conduct house history workshops occasionally. But there's a lot of resources for researching your house history. Once the DC Recorder of Deeds database for sales. Um, there's all kinds of maps at the online at the DC Public Library. Um, I do house history, so what do I do? Uh, <laughs> The city directories, the cent the census is online. You can get to uh, what's it called? Uh, Ancestry.com through the DC Public Library if you have a library card. You can get to all kinds of resources through the library's databases with a library card. Yeah, even there the historic newspaper databases can be useful. Just plug, you know, plug yeah. in the address of your house and right, see I do that a lot. Appeared in the paper. Right. There might be an ad for it when it was new. There might be something about, you know, somebody who lived at that address. Usually uh, it's because they died, but anyway, or, or they yeah, were or in a crime. <laughs> crime. Some crime was committed. But <laughs> you get their name and you can plug in their name. 
Uh, yeah, I've turned over house histories to people that were like all bad news. <laughs> but, you know, it's fascinating anyway. And, that, and uh, the based real estate maps, um, which are summer online through 1919 at the um, Library of Congress, on the Library of Congress website, there are also physically up, you know, many more recent ones at the DC History Center and the DC Public Library, both of which are open now, open again. Um, you can see your house or, you know, lot on, on those maps over the years. That's really helpful. May I, may I just bring up something just uh, techno technological? There's no way for us to save the, the chat. I've tried several times. Uh, I don't know why. Sometimes in Zoom, most of the time, you can click on something and save it and keep all the information, and I'm not able to do that. Yeah, I actually see that. Uh, the three uh, in my where I would write a message, there's the three dots that you would right click on, and then you can save the chat usually. But click, maybe click it, on it and try to do it. Oh, I see your uh, right. Will it be saved? It, it might be disabled or something, but maybe, perhaps yeah. it can be saved. Maybe, perhaps it can be shared out uh, after the, That's the, the point program. Yes, and thank you because it's, it, I think that it. Uh, I think that it saves it for us. Is that correct, Tracy? Like it sends it to us after the fact. Yes, I can share it out after, and I'll see if I can change the settings right now, mm -hmm. so that if anyone wants to save it, they can go ahead and do so. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee about, um, you know, kind of oral history approach uh, when interviewing white people whose families left neighborhoods where black people were moving in. What did you do to encourage candor so that the white people would talk about their experiences honestly? They were children, so they weren't making the decision. That's, I think, in all cases, that was, that's what we've found because it was happening around 1960. Right, yeah, so. I mean, they were, uh, it was, it was interesting because some of them, I think, hadn't particularly given it, you know, maybe they hadn't thought about it a while before we, you know, talked to them because it had happened, you know, when they were children, but when they, you know, would recollect who was, you know, that who was moving to the block at the time and who their friends were and uh, some of them were, you know, friends with some of the black families on the block that were, you know, there was this, this transitional period where their blocks were integrated, but that's, you know, um, uh, they were interested in, in knowing more about that history themselves and sort of, and reflecting on it and, and what their role might've been in it. So I, I think, I, I don't think we had a lot of trouble, at, you know, establishing, you know, getting them to be, to be open about that they were very interested in the in the project themselves. We actually got the impression that some of the Sarah played a couple of clips, the Eleanor Craig one and the Genevieve Anderson, that were, I think both of those right were done by high school seniors. We trained the seniors these this class at um, E. L. Haynes Charter School, which is in Ward Four, and on uh, Grant Circle and. We, we got the impression that the, the narrators, the people they interviewed might have been a little more candid with them than they might have been with us because the seniors were mostly or all people of color. So one of them would say like, we, we, no white people ever came here and we were glad about that or, we, or it was fine with us. They might not have said that to us. They might have thought that was rude or something, but we wouldn't care. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, the person who said that was Genevieve Anderson, and she was my, the, she's the neighbor of a white friend of mine. <laughs> and, uh, and so she says, you know, it was, you know, everybody around here was black. It was all black, and we liked it that way. <laughs> and and Jen, my friend Jen, who's, you know, friendly, friends with this person now, was, you know, <laughs> kind of shocked. And, I, I, you know, it's not something that she would have ever said to her, uh, <laughs> but she said it to these, these kids that were interviewing her. <laughs> but the white people, I interviewed quite a few white people who'd moved from Mount Pleasant also around 1960, but mostly they just said it was time to move, something like that. I mean, they didn't really, 
I didn't have anyone sort of go introspective and, you know, to talk about why their parents might have chosen to move. Everybody, all the neighbors were moving, so we moved. We moved where the neighbors were moving to, in fact. We moved to the same neighborhood as where the, our neighbors were moving in Wheaton or Silver Spring. And there's something to be said for that. Yeah. Um, so um, just like a quick note here about saving the chat. I know that noticed on my screen, um, Tracy just asked me to try it out really quick. And there's a little um, icon um, right above the chat box that looks like a little piece of paper. And I don't know if that's on everybody's screen or not, but if you click on that, it gives you several options of how you wanna save the chat. And one of them is to save it to your computer. Um, and, you know, like if, if not everybody has that, we can definitely, you know, share the chat out after the program's over. But if you do have that, you know, you could try to do it right now um, I yourself just, that way. Yeah I, yeah, I just tried that and it, and it took me to a place for saving visuals. So I'm sort of confused. And I don't hmm. see it either. I do see Pat Tyson raised her hand. Yeah, it's... Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, we'll we'll send the chat out after the fact then. Um, and um, uh, Tracy, are you able to elevate uh, Miss Tyson? Okay, there we go. Am I am I unmuted now? Yep, you're on. Oh okay. Well, this is this this session has absolutely been so great, and I, I was just sitting here thinking, in fact, I, Jasper, I haven't seen you in such a long time. Good to see you. Good, good um, to hear from you. Yes, I can, I can uh, hear you. Um, let me see something. I was gonna put my picture up, but anyway, you don't need to see who I am. Um, the, the program itself is so helpful. Uh, I think it helped, I don't know how to, how to say it, but this knocks down a lot of fear that people have uh, or questions. You know, sometimes on both sides of the race question, it's uh, both sides are fearful. And they don't talk and they don't know what each other has experienced. So I would say that these sessions um, Mara and Sarah are doing are so helpful. And I think it helps to break down fear um, um, it's just really uh, amazing because unless you talk about something, you still hold those same old ideas and you still think the same old ideas exist. And many times they don't. It's just that people are fearful to, to speak out. And we've made so much progress in um, races, uh, race relationships. But still, we know we have a, a long way to go. But if, if people could just understand um, what you've discussed here today, the interviews and the, um, the session here afterwards, the conversation, it, it, it helps people, I think, to relax. That's all I wanted to say. We should say that Pat Tyson's group, the Military Road School Preservation Trust has been our grant sponsor on various, various grants over since 2015 or so for mapping segregation. So, um, and a pleasure. Thanks, Pat. It's so great but, to hear from you. But one of the, that, what Pat just said, that um, <clears throat> just familiar, talking to people does a lot of good. That fear yes. goes away when you get to know people. Yes. And they're just like other they're just your friends or your neighbors. They're not some they're not other anymore. Yes. Exactly. And so and maybe some of these oral history interviews can go part way to, you know, when people listen to them, to realizing that these people, these narrators are regular people. They have the same mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm experiences you do or I mean maybe they're slightly different but they also went, went shopping removed hornet's nests from the backyard they yes. you know had to go to high school maybe they hated high school too you know all those kinds of things you find commonalities 
when you talk to people directly, or maybe this is like a step in between is to listen to their interviews. I, I, live, I live in uh, Silver Spring, um, but of course, most of my life was spent in my early years all in DC. But, um, and when Carol Olivia said she had a beehive, I, I've got one too, I just found the other day, but it's big, bigger, about five times bigger than hers was. And so I've got to wait till the fall when I can find somebody who can take it down for me. But we, we can, I can give you, we've got bee people, not beehive, hornet. Hornet and bees are very different. If you've got a beehive. Oh, okay. Well, well, these are wasps. These are wasp. These are wasp nests, not a beehive. You can get honey from a beehive. Don't, don't oh. hurt the bees, please. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, that's going to be an, uh, an adventure. But uh, I, I say that to say her, her, her object there was something unexpected that united people. And um, here in Silver Spring, we had such a such an opposite, uh, an object, a rickety old bridge, where and when I was growing up, I understand people on and, and, and what divided the two neighborhoods was that bridge over the railroad tracks. And as I understand it, when I was growing up, the people on the other side of the bridge were all white and hated, didn't want us to come to their neighborhood. And the people on this side, of course, they had to go through it. They wanted to get to downtown Silver Spring faster. And that attitude prevailed for so many years. And it became a problem with the county, and they didn't want to deal with it. So they waited for the bridge to rot out and fall down. And it, it, it finally rotted enough that they came up uh, and closed it one night and didn't inform any neighborhood. Um, because it was used by quite a few people. But they, they, they didn't inform anybody. They didn't want to deal with it. It was a problem. And sometimes our politicians don't want to deal with things. It's a problem. It might not get them elected or they have something in mind. Well, when they closed the bridge, the people on the other side were so upset, uh, some of them, and we were upset, and we didn't know that they were going to be upset or that they were upset until we called our officials in and said, hey, what have you done? The thing that happened was, and, and I'm gonna end this real fast, a guy in another neighborhood that connects these neighborhoods, these three neighborhoods, he made a film. I don't know why he went up there on the bridge and after it closed, he, made, he took his son up there. They made a film about the story of the bridge. And when the other side, which were all young people that had moved in, all those old people had died. <laughs> and all the old people on our side had died. So here we have two neighborhoods that, that liked the bridge, wanted it to stay, but the old mood existed, as we thought and they didn't know about, it. and they got highly upset and came, uh, we all got upset with the county and called them in to find out why they closed it and to tell everybody. But that one old rickety bridge created an opportunity for us to get together and break this racial barrier. And now it's like we can't do without each other and we're willing to work on all projects that affect our area. So it, it takes sometimes a little insignificant object you don't even think could do anything that could turn the situation around. That's all I want to say. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Tyson. Uh, really great to hear from you and really appreciate you, uh, you know, sharing with us. Um, before we end, I just wanted to, you know, ask our panelists if they had, you know, one more thing that they wanted to, wanted to say um, about the project or, um, you know, about the topic. Well, I did interview Pat and her sister one time. I can't remember if that's on if that's on the DC Public Library site. I'm going to have to find out about that. It was a great interview about the neighborhood in Silver Spring, this neighborhood she was just talking about. I think I, I managed to get in all my extras uh, with, with the questions. I had some extras, but you got them all out of me that I was I hoped to share. But thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I, 
I would say um, in uh, another uh, something else for people that are interested in doing their own oral history view, interviews that some sometimes what can help is to especially if you're interviewing a, an elder uh, is to to include their um, you know uh, son or daughter you know somebody else that's close with them and their family and who may have you know gone through the same experiences but obviously it was very different you know in a different from a different perspective but include them in the interview because they can really help sort of bridge uh, and, and ask the questions and, and chime in and jog memories. And uh, so I, there's, there's many, I, I think there's, there's at least a few interviews that I've done that way. And they're not always, you know, that doesn't always work. Some people are just reticent and you ne won't necessarily get them to share, but, um, but some people, you know, will, will share in the presence, you know, if you've got somebody else working with you on, on uh, <laughs> pulling out those memories. <laughs> Another thing is to reassure people. A lot of people are very reluctant because they think that it's kind of like a quiz and they're going to be asked all these dates and facts and things and their memory will, and they won't be able to, they'll get it wrong. And so I always say, it's not about that because then we could, you know, we can look that up. What we're looking for is your particular memories, your stories and your memories and only you have them or they're in your family. And maybe you're the only source. And so, you know, it's important to get those on tape because you've got your own perspective and your own, you know, memories and, and, and family stories. And, you know, they'll be lost if we don't, if you don't get them recorded. And just forget, don't worry about the facts. I mean, try for them, but don't. Oral history. Don't get hung up on the fact. Because it's a, it's your perceptions of, of, you know, what's happened. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, there's just like a, you know, few more things here that I want to say. I know we're running over time a little bit. Tracy just put in the chat a link to a survey. It just takes a few minutes to fill that out. So please, if you can, click on that link, fill out the survey, uh, just to give us a little bit more information about how we can keep making these programs better from month to month. Uh, next month, she also put the link to the registration for the oral history coffee chat uh, for September, which will feature the project pandemic to protest black bartenders in DC. So uh, please uh, register for that. And join us again next month. Um, we also had a couple of questions in the chat about where, where you can get resources to do projects um, through the DC Oral History Collaborative. Uh, we do have grants programs. Uh, we have grants for new oral history projects, extensions of those new oral history project grants, and grants for public programs that use existing oral histories. Uh, the RFPs for those grants should come out this fall, so please um, check with the Humanities DC website, sign up for our newsletter so you can be aware as soon as those requests for proposals are out. We also offer trainings to the public, and we're planning on scheduling another one of those training sessions um, towards the end of September, beginning of October. So also please check out our website for those as well. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, and uh, with that, I hope everybody has a good weekend and um, uh, that concludes the program. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jasper, thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for everyone. <laughs>